real estate valuation. And we've got a bunch of experts up here that have worked on uh, two of, if not the largest, real estate cases during the course of the pandemic, uh, CBL and Washington Prime Group, both mall owners, and we'll get into the specifics in a minute, but I did want to introduce everybody. Um, to my immediate left, Ronan Bojmel from Guggenheim, who heads up the restructuring practice. Chad Husnick from Kirkland and Ellis. He's a partner in the group and my personal lawyer as well. Uh, Barack Klein from Molis and Company. He's a partner at Molis. Damian Scheibel from Davis Polk, who heads up the restructuring practice. And Robert Stark from Brown Rundick, who heads up the restructuring practice there. Um, and everybody, again, in this group, um, Barack led the CBL case. Ronan, Chad, Damian, and Robert led uh, the Washington Prime case. And we thought it'd be interesting to really debate uh, the specifics between the two and kind of take a step back and understand the landscape for these companies and how much tremendous pressure each was under. So I'm going to start with Barack to maybe give a little backdrop on CBL, um, the capital structure, and frankly, what led to the filing. Yeah. Can everybody hear? Yep. Okay, good. We are told that the middle mic was, uh, was a problem. So I, I think, as was alluded to, um, these two cases, while they are real estate uh, and mall related, they were very, very different setups. Um, and Ronan will go through what the setup at Prime was. But for CBL, um, one of the key differentiators was that the company had a, a ton of leverage. Um, and the reason why was because the banks didn't have blanket collateral. Um, we basically had a, a capital structure that was bifurcated, where the banks had a portion of the, of the assets as collateral, had an unsecured parent guarantee, and we had a massive amount of unsecured bonds. And the banks you know, couldn't just say and dictate control of the case because they could only look to their collateral as security. And their treatment, um, you know, was, was kind of up for grabs on how they got treated on an unsecured basis. Um, additionally, we had the right to be able to move collateral around as long as we complied with certain provisions in the bond indenture. So um, we really kind of had both sets of creditors uh, you know, kind of in a, in a tug of war for the hearts and minds of the company. Um, and additionally, the equity, um, you know, we had, we had a big slug of preferred, and, um, you know, the common equity was well represented on the board, both in virtue of the, it was a family, uh, second generation, maybe, maybe third generation business um, run by the Leibowitz family, it was well represented, and there was an activist as well on the board, a uh, shareholder. Um, so, you know, our, our mindset of the board was certainly, you know, partially um, to get, you know, compensated for the leverage that we could apply, you know, throughout the case. Um, we did not, you know, just going through some other differentials that, that we can then you know, shift over is, you know, we, we did not need new money. Um, we had drawn the revolver in full mm -hmm. as soon as we could. So we had nice $300 million, balance, you know, cash and balance sheet, you know, uh, in addition to whatever we had on hand, which obviously didn't uh, make the banks all that happy, since they uh, again were, you know, dealing with uh, a company that you know could theoretically, uh, you know, put them in a bad spot. Um, Is there a representative of the banks in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, um, and uh, you know, look, at the end of the day, our goals sure. were, were were threefold, right? We wanted um, equity, wanted to get compensated, we wanted to delever because this company needed had too much debt. And we wanted a capital to come up with max flexibility because no one knew where the industry was going to go. And that was our goals. And we were just able to apply leverage on both sides because we didn't need cash. And both sets of creditors needed us. And um, I think that that's a very different initial setup going in. We can talk about how we, we kind of process it through. But as opposed to you know everybody else on the panel who worked on Prime, CBL had a very, very different setup, even though the industry dynamics that we were facing were, were very similar. Ronan, you want to cover Washington Prime? Yeah, I'll cover a little bit. I mean, the biggest difference was that we had Damien, and they didn't. That uh, made a big difference in the case. <laughs> um, but maybe taking a step just a bit. <laughs> it wasn't part of the recovery. 
Start to. <laughs> now, this is going to be a fun one. Wow. I think all of you guys drinking, know. Right? Okay. Both, both companies, both companies are, are mall REITs, and um, that was great. in terms of uh, <laughs> asset to mix and composition, the CBL is more of an enclosed mall REIT, while uh, Washington Prime was actually a mix of enclosed and, and open air, uh, an open air uh, type, uh, you know, retail properties. Uh, but uh, the landscape uh, and the backdrop to these two restructurings were very different. In, in Washington Prime, we, uh, you know, Kirkland and uh, Guggenheim, came to the scene at the kind of, actually Guggenheim, I think you guys were already there, at the back end of a company attempting to uh, execute an out of court type you know, restructuring, uh, bring in some capital, convert some bonds into preferred, which was, uh, which was Unsuccessful. Uh, before the company filed, um, we did we did need uh, financing. Uh, we had collateral, and you know we were able to the extent uh, we so desired to file with an uh, independent dip. Ultimately, we we filed with a plan. Um, the company was public widely. You know the equity was widely distributed, um, but we uh, dealt with a creditor body that was uh, that was united. Um, Damien's uh, client uh, hold, held uh, the majority of the company's bonds as well as a third of the company's uh, bank debt and there was another group that had the other third. So the company's creditors in the case of Washington Prime were working uh, together uh, uh, on a plan uh, with us, with the company and its advisors and shareholders and, and preferred holders were in the background uh, until later, later in the case. Uh, <clears throat> when we filed, and the timing of the filing and decisions of what to do were very different. Um, in Washington Prime, which reminds me a little bit of GGP about 10 years ago, the secured lenders have actually been the instigators of the bankruptcy and the restructuring. In the case of GGP at the time, it was really the, the uh, special services who declared defaults on properties when the credit markets were closed. And I think in the case of CBL, it was really the banks who instigated a need to file for bankruptcy. Yeah, they, they, were, they, were, they were pissed because we chose to deal with the bonds. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they took whatever actions they could to agitate, and eventually we ended up filing um, not a full RSA, but we had an agreement with the bonds. We locked hands with them, and we were then going in to fight the banks. Exactly. In, 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 C, in, um, in Washington Prime, I know we saw the writing on the wall a few months in advance. We saw upcoming, you know, defaults uh, and a liquidity uh, crisis, and so we needed to uh, initiate conversations with the creditors, which were, you know, all in ready and willing to uh, to negotiate. Uh, but at the same time, the timing of these events uh, led us to believe that it was important in order to attempt to maximize the value of the company. Uh, and pin uh, evaluation, uh, so to speak, was to actually launch a sale process. And the timings were very different in a material way. I think when CBL was um, exploring options, this was really and ultimately entering into like at least the initial cut between the junior stakeholders was in kind of mid to late 2020. Yeah, yeah so, we, we, so we had a couple rounds at the RSA, obviously, because we because uh, wasn't sure where the capital structure would land out. We initially cut a deal, I think, in August, uh, September of 2020. Um, and, uh, but that was without all the pieces together. Eventually, we ended up uh, you know, litigating with the banks, and then everything kind of got solidified again in February of 21. This page. This is the last page. So, I, I mean, I, I want to just uh, demonstrate to you the kind of difference in the, uh, this is the last page. Just a difference in the kind of landscape uh, for when uh, the negotiations and the kind of equity splits, so to speak, you know, were done. So in the case of CBL, you look at the, these, these are, uh, you know, cap rates or implied cap rates. You look at the timing for when the initial deal got cut was really towards kind of closer to September 2020, which, you know, was a period in which 
yields and cap rates kind of spiked, which means valuations kept declining given the COVID environment. In Washington Prime, those discussions, those thoughts about valuations and the strategy that we have pursued were really at the backdrop of declining yields and to some extent uh, an improving environment. So, you know, we've had a little bit less certainty and visibility as to where the markets were going when we've decided to enter into a, a plan with the creditors of the company. Again, ultimately, the kind of plan that we've entered into uh, was a plan with the company's creditors, uh, essentially the entire body of the company's creditors, or the majority of all the classes, at an environment of improving yields. And that was a time, kind of mid-2021, where not only yields have improved, but consumer confidence you know, was improving, uh, and the market looked better and you know, with a, a brighter horizon. So, the kind of deal that we cut had some baseline recovery to the um, uh, junior stakeholders, which were not on the table, is, which is different than CBL, uh, plus a uh, very hard fought um, a sale process during which we were able to solicit, you know, something along the lines of 60 to 70 parties and in interest in the company's assets. Yeah, so I mean, just, just to sort of second what Ronan was saying, you know, the negotiation between the creditors and the company, the, 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 the fiercest negotiation were those two points, how much value we were going to be providing to equity um, when equity itself was not, as Ronan said, not represented specifically. It was really the board and management and the advisors that were, um, that were really acting as a, as a you know, pretty, pretty good and pretty strong so the equity tip, or I call it equity tip amount, the equity amount that we were going to be giving, the amount we were going to be giving to equity um, was, was, a, was a hard fought negotiation. And then, and I'll get to this in a second, the marketing process was the other hardest fought negotiation. But what you have to not lose sight of is we were able to focus on those two things. And this is, you know, we got this done, um, negotiated anyway, from the period from call it March to June, and the, the final days in June. So from March to June, we were able to address those issues and get to an RSA that everyone could stand behind and that we could go into court with um, because in part of my client, right? Um, SVP had decided that it you know, was wanted to be a significant equity owner of this company. They had done their work, they had, they had, it was within their mandate and they had decided that that's what they were going to do. So by the time of the filing, they held almost two thirds of the bonds and um, the term loan, they, they held uh, you know, approximately a third of. And what we did was we, before negotiating, or maybe at the same time we were negotiating with the company, but we prioritized getting to a deal on our exit financing first. So we went to the term lenders um, and we negotiated a deal with the term loans for what they were gonna get in the bankruptcy, which was a combination of cash and take back paper and the terms of their take back paper. We got that deal done first. And the reason we did that was we wanted to know what our exit financing was going to look like. We wanted to know what the company that SVP was going to own a majority of was going to look like even before we cut the deal with the company. So then when we went to the company, we were lockstep with the term loans. We had our exit financing. We had the term loans resolved. We, we equaled other than numerosity, you know, from, from a value percentage, we equaled the acceptance effectively of the notes. And so we were able to go to the company and negotiate a more streamlined deal and focus on what really matters. And Chad, maybe you can comment on how and why it was so important, you know, from the company's perspective to have an appropriate marketing process as well as the equity recovery. And then I think it's a good segue to Mr. Stark, who came in on behalf of the equity and, you know, had some interesting views on valuation that inform the entire analysis. Yeah, a couple of, one dynamic. <clears throat> a major, and Ronan alluded to it, but there was a major switch in stakeholders in early 2021, I think. Um, we were a lot more like CBL, quite frankly, with diverse bondholders, and we had one big bondholder, but it was diverse from our secured debt. And Damien had come in with some big lenders within the secured debts. So we had already started talking to Damien. However, overnight, um, 
I, I remember it was a Friday night. I got a weird call. It said something's going to happen. I woke up Monday morning and I had a brand new three-quarter bond holder, and, and it was SVP had bought. Not only were they holding a third, more than a third of the bank debt, and when added together with their other co-members, they were over 50% of the bank debt. They had now bought two-thirds of the bond debt uh, and rising, and so the dynamic switched overnight and it took away a lot of the leverage that the company would have had you know to play the bonds off the banks now we had to play them together um, and keep in mind the equity and that's where it became very difficult because as Josh was suggesting we began to recognize that there were there was going to be a very very difficult valuation fight for all the reasons Ronan can mention you can see the volatility on the slide here uh, of the way things were going on the cap rates but it was hard to predict where it was going to be in a month, let alone three months. Uh, the vaccine had started to come out in late 2020. We expected that it was going to go around fast. We didn't see that. Uh, then it was slower. But in the beginning, or March, May, I'm sorry, February, March, it actually, the vaccine started to uptick. We saw huge increases in foot traffic in the malls. And so it was just incredibly difficult to predict where it was going to be. And we knew full well that we were going to have a real valuation trial with um, real counsel on the other side, that we were going to have difficulty uh, winning, whether we had the best valuation expert on the planet. Um, you know, it, it was just going to be difficult to win. So that's where we introduced the concept of running a marketing process. And we knew full well that it couldn't be just a token market test you know, where we go to five people and, and call it a day after two weeks. That's what Damien wanted. That is what Damien <laughs> wanted. Um, but even Damien, I remember having some calls with him, acknowledged that there need, there, it was going to be easier if we did that. It was a major shift from what you'd seen in most cases, especially where a single creditor has that much control in the, in the capital structure. Um, but it was something that our board laid in the tracks on. Uh, largely because they recognized if we got drawn into a nine-month valuation trial, and we, were, we had the benefit, one of the benefits that WPG had was the benefit of having saw what happened in PRE and the skirmishes amongst the first lien lenders there. And I won't say that that's why SVP exercised discretion to go buy the bonds and make sure that they had more than a third of the bank debt, but I suspect that's why they did what they did. And we saw what happened in CBL, um, not necessarily around the filing, but on the valuation front. We saw that developing and we knew that was going to be a big deal. And we looked for an opportunity to try and short circuit that large, long, drawn out valuation trial. Uh, and the marketing process was our tool to do so. Bob? So, I mean, I guess also just one point on the valuation it analysis itself. In our case, we had a whole creditor body united and so we could have won a valuation fight and still <laughs> needed to settle it and so you know it wasn't about okay the valuation is different people get different splits or crammed with different splits it, we're still needed to we still needed to uh, have a deal with the creditors yeah i think we were just simply trying to best position ourselves for whatever the debate would have been and you know the court itself made a comment at the first day hearing that you know, if you're going to get up here with a bunch of experts and tell me about real estate valuation, I'll be very interested because it's inherently flawed. Yeah, yeah um, and, and the judge could have said the valuation was three billion or four billion dollars, and then we'd have looked at Damien and said, "Oh, now what are we going to do? Because you have two thirds of it, and you're not going to support a plan that gives that much of a recovery to act." But it's interesting because you know Robert's perspective is important, right? You know, notwithstanding all the squirmishes here, this case got done in a relatively expedited timeline. Something that we talked about early on this morning about these cases being compressed. This was a case where, you know, kind of old school restructuring, you start at the top of the capital structure and work your way through. We had the benefit of one creditor having secured an unsecured debt, but we had an official committee of unsecured creditors that was ultimately disbanded. And then we had an official equity committee and the equity committee didn't get appointed until, I don't know, five, six weeks into the case. And so you, you had a gun against you because we were coming up to confirmation and some pretty difficult valuation issues to grapple with. So, interested in your perspective. Okay, don't push me again. Um, <laughs> so, um, camera will show. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing that. That's going to be fun. Um, look, and, and I'll talk about the valuation stuff in a minute. And a lot of what you say, I agree with all of you, what you say, especially with 
that, so I agree with him. A lot of it I don't agree with, I'll tell you where. But, um, especially Ronan's point. Um, but uh, look, from, from CBL, no, you can't, see, you can't hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Little guy, little voice. Um, CBL, there wasn't an adversary process when it came to valuation. The fight was the banks versus the unsecured bonds, and that became myopic, right? Efforts to get to, uh, you'll have your chance. When, you know, when, you get to, when you get to stockholders, you can't have an equity committee because you gotta settle that deal between the banks and the bonds because the banks got liens and you gotta get a financing package in place and you gotta get to a restructuring. It's like the beginning of the Great Recession, right? We've got to save the firm ethos and it becomes myopic. It's the only thing you can do. Having a true valuation fight at the committee level or below is pretty distracting to the fundamental issue of the case, and I appreciate the time constraints. Is that right, Well, Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add is though, right, we settled for what everybody thought was a really good outcome for equity up front. So you had an activist on the board, you had a family that Fair cared point. about the equity. Fair point. We filed with 11% going to people that were wildly out of the money. And if you can find that, you know, with, with, the, massive, with the billion dollars of deleveraging going, if you find that anywhere else, good luck. Yeah, and I, see, th I think that's, that, that, but that's the problem. You're yeah. sitting here saying wildly out of the money, and you know your views on that and mine may be very, very different about that. And and the reality of it is, is that a court determines whether or not people are wildly out of the money only if you have somebody sitting on the other side of the table. Right. But there was. You there cut was, a wait. Let me finish. You cut a deal pre-petition in the smoky back rooms. Damien's the master of this. Then you come into bankruptcy. <laughs> With all of your buttressing around that deal, with your dips and your commitments for, no for financing and RSAs and all that kind of stuff, and the case has got to go on this really quick mile uh, program, and if you don't do it that way, then oh my God, everything's going to blow up. Now I understand CBL came with a plan that had for equity, and that was. And I understand. It wasn't rushed. We were in court for 12 months, right? There, there was ample time. Right. The, the plan, plan was filed in May. And everybody was like, oh my God, you got a great outcome for, but the for but profit the, and, but and the common. How we split it is the issue. I'm just saying, from, and I'm not saying that your deal was yeah. wrong. I'm just saying from a process perspective, the parties were not positioned to have a, a big investment in whether or not your enterprise value was or was not right, because you had a deal. And you were trying to get the banks to comply with the deal because of the vagaries of their collateral packaging. Right. I, that I was you. the myopic yeah. thing I, about yeah. the case. I hear you. And so and it, very it, may been, it may have been a right deal. I mean, it was a very different profile company than, than Washington Prime. Yeah, correct. And, and so, Bob, uh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead. When we filed, we were, sorry. When we filed, we were um, very close to essentially filing a, a, a free fall, a, a complete you know, free fall. Um, you know, the, ultimately we've decided to file with a plan because uh, Damien was kind enough to allow us to facilitate or continue the sale process that we you know we started, and, and the reason why we were it's able not, it's to stop like feeding him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to get him to yeah, yeah, yeah. He still <laughs> respond. He votes. Uh, the reason why, uh, <laughs> and the reason why you know we were in a position to do that was because we had collateral. I mean, most in most companies today are over levered on a secured basis. Right. And, and the companies are really, you know, shackled with their secured creditors, dip milestones, and the whole thing. They're really, in our case, I think it was in CBLs too. But again, the backdrop was different because again, when they cut the deal at the absolute worst time of the pandemic, you know, we cut a deal at a much look at the time where mm -hmm. things look. So, you know, without the ability to shop the company, really and seriously. You know, I don't know that we would have filed do you, do you a, a perceive, plan. With did you perceive that your shopping process really did ferret out fair market value? Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about that, because I think that's the rub of it. Yeah, right. Fair market value, as I was trained, is a very different valuation standard than true inherent value, which is, at least according to the law that I know, the valuation for plan purposes. And they're very different. They can overlap, that's right. but the fair market value is the what a willing buyer and a willing seller agree upon without compulsion, with full opportunity and full knowledge. Okay, you think that your bidding process, and, and by the way, the the assumption is that true inherent value, which is cash flow driven, is expected future cash flows of property over time, discounted back. That's why DCF is so important for plan confirmation purposes. Venn diagrams over fair market value because one presumes 
in a true and M&A process, an efficient and knowledgeable M&A process that people will buy and people will sell for future cash flows, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, you also have to kind of get into that Eugene Fama efficient market kind of theory. Is in fact what you're doing equivalent with efficient markets such that when you run your process, anybody, everybody can look back and say, you got willing buyer, willing seller, no compulsion, full information. Now, every banker in, in bankruptcy says, of course that's what I did. Damien let me have 27 days. I could give no information. I got a plan in the backdrop. I've got mm -hmm. milestones here, there, and yon. I got a court who already starts off saying, I don't want to have a valuation fight, and oh, but you're going to get fair market value. Uh, I just think that's so, wrong. So we never litigated this because we settled, right? right? But I think you said it right, exactly right, Robert. That is the fundamental disagreement. The fundamental disagreement is over whether what we did was a close enough approximation to a full and fair marketing process right. or not. Now, the world's not perfect. And so you're not going to get perfect, right? Perfect would have been, let's hang out and have someone fund this company for the next six months while we, while we run around, right? That totally would have been perfect. And, and you've said in interviews that I've read as recently as last night again, um, that, that, the whole, <laughs> that, that the fundamental aspect of this case was that we were running a market, or a fundamental aspect, was we were running a marketing process for a whole. When you, what you had was 102 independent little businesses and little malls. Right. Those independent little businesses and little malls are super simple. They're widget manufacturers. It's literally cap rate and, and, and the amount so of money that goes in and cash comes out. And that's what everyone in the market was buying them on, is what's the projected future cash flows of this property? And I'll tell you, because I actually talked to several um, REITs and, and several other like, uh, like investors, including some who I found out only afterwards had actually bid here, um, and at the time and afterwards, and asked them, how long does it take you on a, on a, on a, on a, on a auction basis outside of bankruptcy court to actually be able to value these properties? And the answer is, they're, to them, they're widgets. And they were gonna be the highest and best, unless you're gonna spend six months in bankruptcy with someone paying for it. So my only point is, was it perfect? For sure, no. But I would argue that the marketing process was actually designed to be as good as could be done under the circumstances and be a fairly approximate um, for the value. And, so and let, wait, Robert, before you, yeah. you go in, I think it's important to note, right, the, the marketing process was one piece and it was the kind of the top bread and the bottom piece of the bread was a 6% floor on equity recovery that we negotiated. Oh, and, and, and by the way, I, and I'll, I'll do it public, I've been doing it publicly for a while, I think you guys did a great job in those negotiations. You actually did, and, and Brock, you too, and CBL, you got distributions for equity as Again, it, it was in a world where information was difficult and valuation concepts were difficult to apply. How do you normalize any of this? And that, and that was Ronan's and, point, and, which and, is a free fall is always compared to what? And for us, it was compared to a 6% yeah. floor and a marketing process, albeit one that we would have liked to have been and, and longer. I'll, and I'll even admit this, and, and, and that sometimes when equity shows up and punches the gift horse in the mouth and says it's proof positive that there's value there, you guys are reeling in your shoes, and rightfully so, because you're like, you did a good job. And, you know, especially when it's sort of that day trader mentality of people saying, well, it's trading in the market, maybe I can kind of fleece the senior guys by kind of... Well, that's why your approach in this case was the right one. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. But, yeah. that. but, I mean, the reality of it is is that it's got to be a principled theory, and, and my general view, and again, I, I have no problem with what you did in CBL. It's just you have to appreciate that there was no adversary process in that dynamic to ferret out true inherent value because there were other issues in that case that drove it. In Washington, so it's not as good of a, of a, of a precedent in terms of what to be done. It was a creature of whatever the deal was under those circumstances because of the, of the surrounding circumstances. Washington Prime, though, was a true, in my opinion, crucible of a valuation kind of a situation in the space because, and, and Chad said it, I think, quite articulately, you, you were in a situation where the dynamic had changed, the timing had changed, it was not myopic because the banks were on board the deal, SVP had collapsed all of the capital structure and support that was necessary to move forward, you guys did negotiate some value and it was not a tip, it was real, um, for equity, and the question became was, was what was done in an approximation sort of a way 
appropriate, and there was a valuation challenge, and it ultimately ended up in a deal that wasn't super far off. It, it, equity ended up getting 10.5% of the new company, and that we must have done something right, because shortly thereafter, your client tendered at a premium for the rest, and so people walked away, and the market really appreciated that. And it felt like the deal was working well, but back to the academic point about fair market value, because I actually think this is really fascinating. I, I, I am not a believer, and I've said this quite widely, widely that 363 processes ever correlate to FAMA and efficient market hypothesis. They can't. They can't. Because, you know, to have an efficient market hypothesis, you have to have a concept of information flow out there, no compulsion, and like invisible hand is going to lift to the proper point. And you can't. It's all too much strategic stuff going on. And you had serious barriers to entry, serious barriers to entry. Under the RSA, you had not only did, was it a really tight milestone, because of tax implications and because SVP liked their deal, only bidders that would put $2.3 billion cash in the barrel head would be deemed qualified bidders that can move forward, right? That's a really big check to stroke. And it's not a simple case. I, I'm sorry, you're, you're, I just violently disagree with that. 105, 102, whatever the number is, of malls operating all over the country, all with very different store bases, with different geographical issues and foot pa traffic patterns and COVID, right? You had very distinct businesses that needed to be valued on the bottom top. I, I'm, I will always say this, top-downs, analytics, and restructuring is the easy way. And everybody says, oh, we can just look at the market pricing or the, or the cap rates or whatever. That's not what we're supposed to do. There's way too much mischief in that, and, that, and stuff gets hidden and buried that's wrong. It's a bottoms-up approach, and you've got to do it on a business-by-business -business basis, and the M&A data has to be presented in a way so that within the milestones, people can actually do that work, formulate a bid in an intelligent way, and submit it, especially that amount of, of, of cash that had to be put on, and they could not do it in the Washington Prime. What was the, when was the last time that Washington Prime had an appraisal done before you guys went through anything. Yeah, we, had, we, we had multiple appraisals. I didn't see it in Discovery, anything that was reliable. Whoops. Multiple appraisals. <laughs> Wait, here's a question. How many people have been to a shopping mall in the last 18 months? Wow. That's what I'm going to expect. The reason why I asked the question is because part of our bank fight, which, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. just kind of picked up, we had to value the assets mall by mall. Right. And so we, you know, whether, you know, people are afraid of having a valuation testimony or not, felt pretty good about where we sat when we said, when I said it was out of the money. We knew where the appraisal folks were coming out mm -hmm. on the mall pieces of it. And, you know, while that wasn't, that doesn't do enterprise value per se. But you had a build up from the yeah, bottom. Yeah, we had, well, you, you can build them up both up and down, right? right? We can do it both ways. Kind of, interestingly, across the same cut spot. If, if, you had, if, you had that, if you had that build up from the bottom, then I'll take but it back. Robert, Robert, and right. had this, Robert and I have had this debate for years in multiple different cases. And the bottom line is that I think that you put too much emphasis on and you take too much comfort in, and I think it's very strategic, I don't think it's accidental, I think it's very strategic, that you put too much emphasis in experts. And I would argue that this is excellent. Perfect. My point. The way it should be. <laughs> I would argue that nothing's going to be perfect. I would rather an imperfect but pretty good marketing process to value an asset one way or another, and you would rather a dueling expert valuation trial. And and I'm just and 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 let's just call a spade a spade. In most circumstances, I'm representing creditors who don't mind it being lower. And in most circumstances, you're representing creditors who want it to be higher. And if you do something bottoms up, it's always, almost always going to end up higher. And if you do something top down, it's almost always going to end up lower. My only point is, is the marketing process that I'm arguing for a close enough approximation, and you and I have disagreed on that through 15 cases over the past whatever 10 years, and we'll keep disagreeing on it. I just think when you've got dueling experts, it's it's always going to be I think less accurate, not more accurate. And the good news is, as you pointed out, we had a judge who came out hot from the first day and said he doesn't believe experts in this space, so go run a marketing process. And so the question that he was going to give you rope to ask 
is whether the marketing process that we ran was good enough or not. And yeah, that's what right. we said. We, we have debated it, but you mischaracterized me. I don't, I'm not adverse to market data. I just don't think it's the only data. I think there's other data, and I think every piece of market data needs to be interpreted. Because I've done cases where the bonds were at 70% discount and the stock was $3 a share. So you have internal schizophrenia in markets and there's lots of different markets, right? But there's always the strategic backdrop. People bidding in distress always are asking themselves, not necessarily what the implied value is of the business, but where is it going to, where is the pathology of this case heading towards, right? And since so much is strategic and not the inherent value of the business, it can't be pharma, it can't be efficient. And so you have to interpret it and figure it out. I just think every time let me, everybody says, let me ask you, I want to ask you guys both, to to go, go ahead. But here's a question I have, and I just want to say it, and then you guys can come back to it after you respond. The question I have is, and the reason why I disagree with you, Robert, which, you know, it's okay, we disagree sometimes. Had you prevailed in a valuation dispute in Washington Prime, what happens? That's the, and that's right. It's the, it's the fundamental dilemma. It's the dilemma. practical it's reality. It's the fundamental dilemma. By the way, um, Isger did not say that, you know, I don't believe it. He's, he said, he, and he also, you guys try to stop me from taking discovery on anything beyond the, the marketing process. And he said, no, he's going to have a valuation trial. So, so it, it wasn't as complete as that. But your point is well taken, which is that's the fundamental dilemma with bankruptcy representing people at the bottom part of the capital structure which is, you know, you don't get the luxury of sitting with your arms crossed and just say no to everything. You gotta pay to play. Bid against, bid against them. You know, that Fifth Amendment means something to people with collateral issues. I get that, right? And, and so litigating to a blowing up of the deal um, is a suboptimal way for bankruptcy to look at it. It's also very suboptimal to have to do it, right? I'm always trying to find a solution. It's not always the easiest thing to do, right? What I ask for is my fair day in court, right? That's all I ask for. Don't ask for, uh, and, and because if I have my fair day in court, the answer is always going to be reasonable minds will sit in a room and talk, which is what we did. When the, the moment that the judge said, in response to people trying to, to scale back our discovery demands in Washington Prime, no, they're going to have all, they're going to have their fair day in court, that's when we cut the deal, right? And that's how bankruptcy should work. If it's a fair, ball, call balls and strikes, okay? Nudge the parties to the center call balls and strikes, we will reconstitute the deal. And in this case, I think it really is a great example of you put smart people in a room who know each other, frankly like each other, have done a lot of deals together, and we're not, we don't have to test each other's metal, we'll just talk the concepts, we'll get to a deal. It doesn't have to be binary, uh, you know, win-lose. I was gonna, I was gonna respond to the fair, and, uh, fair process uh, about. You can tell it, there, there very personal. Uh, yeah, you have no, 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 this is a theory. This is not the specific to Washington Prime. Um, bankruptcy sale processes have advantages uh, that regular sale processes don't have. Um, in, in, this, in many cases, you know, buyers know exactly where they need to shoot at, okay? So either they can get there or not. They know that they can get the assets also in a very short time frame. And there's all kinds of benefits. And you get you get fair and uh, free and clear sale. And get, get the orders. Clear. There's a lot benefits. of benefits. Yep. And you know, for this particular case, again, there's nothing to do with us. Um, the market was such that, uh, at least for Washington Prime, and a half of the portfolio was you know open air, and the open air uh, strategics were trading started to trade really, really well. And there was interest, and we knew there was interest, and so that was like an easy find. Is there, you know, an interested buyer at a price where, combined with the enclosed mall portfolio, could actually help us cover the debt? So people knew exactly where they need to shoot at. The slight complexity in our case was that there was no single buyer for the whole thing. So you yeah. needed two buyers, two. and each one was going to be interested in different sets of assets, one for the open air, one for the enclosed. And people didn't know if they're going to spend the time, the other is going to come up with a you know, big enough value. But when we launched the process, we had indicative you know, bids that, in theory, could get us almost there. So we felt pretty good about it. We, felt we thought we can actually get it done. There was no, like, let's just get the market to give us numbers kind of thing. We actually tried to get this thing done. So I kind of like the, the sale process in bankruptcies. They're, every bankruptcy is different, every industry is different. 
I will tell you, you know, from Barack and my perspective, this real estate thing is, is a simple yeah. business, but hard to value, the, the hard to value, especially in a dyna an environment like this. It's, it's and these REITs, they don't file for bankruptcy unless they're in extreme environments, because they're typically well capitalized. And this is, you know, retail, there's troubles, but again, you know, the last time a, a, a real mall REIT uh, filed was GGP. It was in the middle of a crisis. These folks, you know, CBL, P REIT. But can I, can I just get a clarification on one thing you said? You like the 363 processes, and I understand that. And, and, and 363 processes, to me, are, are I don't necessarily believe that the outcome is ever fair market value or true inherent value, but I understand that necessity of the case can sometimes mandate it. If you have a lot of secured debt and you can't get the exit financing, then you gotta run a sales process. That's, but that's different than the valuation question. So are you really on the soapbox saying that your 363 processes across the board don't are like almost fair market three, value? Don't get me wrong, 363 sales processes are a pain in the ass. No, I don't like them. I do them when I need well, to do I, them. You get paid for the pain in the ass. I mean, it's 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 <laughs> it, it's paid, your work. It's what you do. Sell process is a lot of They're, work. Of a course, lot it easier is. to uh, you know to have a deal amongst a few people and cut the pie. It's but that's not the question. The question is: Is it always fair market value is a good reflection of true inherent value? And I, I, not, not yes, I, don't think I will go out on that limb. Not, not <laughs> it's the better indication yeah. of value than most sales sometimes, processes that you can put together outside not. of the bankruptcy. Sometimes not. Bankruptcy. There's well. so every deal he does, and I love him for it. I think he's, uh, he's so brilliant at this, but it's so Machiavellian, right? Every deal he does, he cuts the deal in the smoky back room before the company's files. There's four people in that room. Okay. And, and then, he, and then you guys usher it into bankruptcy. You got your dip milestones and your exit financings and all the buttressing around that deal. And it's impenetrable, right? That's where bankruptcy has migrated to in this post-Jiwala world in which, you know, that and that, and it becomes impossible to have, I, I, we did a valuation on a multi-billion dollar company in like six weeks. Give me another area of law where that's done. That's impossible. But that's the way the world is nowadays. It, it's not supposed to be that way. That's not what our jurisprudence says we're supposed to do. But that's what it is. And ever since Jiwala and the post great, and, the, and the Great Recession and how we've creeped to this place we're at right now, it's a private equity business, right? And you guys come in and you're like, well, it was great. We ran this marketing process and it was super and we but, can do Robert, comps and stuff. Robert, I'm gonna use it's it not fair market value. I'm going I'm to use your argument against you to say that to the extent that you're right and it's become basically a private equity process, that I think just proves my point all the more. In other words, in other, words other parties aside from SVP are able to move really quickly. We see like example after example of private equity and large hedge funds stepping in and writing enormous checks and having really competitive processes yeah, you know, in it, bankruptcy. You know what, if, if, there's if, 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 that, if, if that was that, right, if that was right, none of us would have a job to do. I, I, because I, I, all you do is you throw the company up for sale and it's between Apollo and Oak Tree and SVP and a few yeah. others and they get to take everything and there's no more processes. Well, 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 But I also think there's been an evolution. we're all set. There's been an evolution. This, is, this could go on for hours. Right. <laughs> oh, and it will. There, there's, been an <laughs> there's been an evolution in the capital structures also that, that should be noted. Well, and, right. and by the way, you know, one thing we said this morning, and Robert, you weren't here, right? So all these cases move a lot faster these days. Um, it's because people are more sophisticated and can figure out how to do no, it. No, it's because he makes them move faster. No, but there's a big, there's a big, big, big important you point, throwing, you know, which is at his feet the trade creditors are riding through these cases. Case. Right, these people Not that used to... my cases. A lot of them are getting killed just as much. Which ones? This one, they got paid in full. You had the equity. Because there's no trade for a REIT. There's no unsecured debt for I'm a REIT. Sure there was. People were delivering pizzas. They were doing all sorts yeah, of trade claims. <laughs> um, I don't... Uh, we, are, we are at the end, and I didn't right. save time for questions, but these guys are all going to be available all day. <laughs> uh, they're going to sit outside and continue the debate. We appreciate the time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.